you'll notice that the cover article, a dangerous gap, markets versus the real economy. They're warning us that something isn't right. The past eight weeks have been remarkable. Nonetheless, a gut-wrenching sell-off in shares has been followed by a delirious rally in America. Between February 19th and March 23rd, the S&P 500 lost a third of its value. With barely a pause, it has skyrocketed, recovering more than half of its loss. The catalyst was the news that the Federal Reserve would buy corporate bonds, helping firms, big finance firms, with their debts. Investors shifted from panic to optimism without missing a beat. This rosy view from Wall Street should make you uneasy. Even as the lockdown eases in America, the blow to jobs has been savage. With unemployment rising from 4% to 16%, the highest rate on record since the records began in 1948. With big firm shares soaring, they get help from the Fed. Small businesses are struggling. America's GDP is expected to drop by 10% in the second quarter. Many individual bosses hope that less cost cutting can help protect their margins and pay down debts accumulated with furlough. But in, ab in aggregate, this corporate austerity will depress demand. The likely outcome is a 90% economy that will run far below normal levels. And according to The Economist, the most overlooked risk is a political backlash. A crisis demands sacrifice that will leave a big bill. The clamor for a paycheck will only grow louder if big business is hogged more than its share of the subsidies on offer. It is easy to imagine windfall taxes and bailed out industries. This points to the reality of capitalism, that the profits of the rich and the ultra-rich are not directly linked to your conditions. You can get poorer and poorer, and Wall Street can get richer and richer. But I said they're not directly linked, because in a way, they are linked. And this is the built-in problem of capitalism that Karl Marx explained long ago. First, I believe, the first place he addressed it, if I'm not mistaken, was in The Poverty of Philosophy, his polemic with the anarchist Proudhon. He later addressed it in Capital, in, uh, in texts like Wages, Prices, and Profits, in Theories of Surplus Value, and other texts that were published after his death. Karl Marx explained that the problem with capitalism is this. Under capitalism, production is carried out in order to make profits for the owners. The banks, factories, and industries function not because people need them, but because capitalists can make money from them. Profits are in command in capitalism. And the problem with this is that the capitalist is constantly looking to maximize profits, and the way the capitalist does this is by driving down labor costs, by eliminating workers and jobs with technology, by making the jobs that do exist de-skillable and more easy to replace so he can pay the workers less and make the workers more afraid for their jobs so they don't demand too much. The capitalist is constantly trying to pay as little as possible in order to produce as much as possible, to maximize production, produce as many goods as possible, but pay the lowest amount for doing so. And this inevitably leads to a big problem, which is those workers are also consumers. And as you drive workers down, as you eliminate their jobs, as you make their jobs de-skilled and less payable, as you lower their wages, as you lower their living standards, as you get the workers deeper in debt to survive, as you rip off workers, as you force them to compete in a global market, as the standard of living for workers goes down and further down and further down and further down. As that takes place, the result is that soon the market is glutted with products that can't be sold. Pretty soon the stores are full of iPhones and iPads. The steel market is full of steel. The oil wells are pumped full of oil. And the working class cannot afford to buy them. And you have a crisis of overproduction. The capitalist economist John Maynard Keynes called it underconsumption. 
But this is the boom-bust cycle, and the capitalists have worked so hard to try and resolve this boom-bust cycle. They have the Federal Reserve System to pump money into the economy to try and resolve it. Um, they seize foreign markets to dump their excess products on. Right? The export of capital that's part of imperialism is maintaining developing countries as client states to purchase the excess goods and not develop their own industries. There are many, many efforts by the capitalists to try and overcome this basic built-in problem. But as long as the banks and the factories and the major industries and the natural resources and the major centers of economic power are operated according to profits, you cannot escape this problem. This is the problem in problem inherent in capitalism. Profits in command, production for profit is irrational. And to resolve it, and you need society as a whole to take control of the means of production. The people should take control of the major centers of economic power and operate them for public good. Now, the economist is never going to tell you that. They're advocates of neoliberalism. They're advocates of privatizations and austerity. They're advocates of tearing down socialist governments. But anyone who understands economics knows that there's a big problem. There is a very, very big problem, a dangerous gap, as The Economist calls it, a dangerous gap. Much was written about jobless recoveries. And they saw this in the lead up to the financial crisis. In 1991, the economy recovered from a brief economic downturn, but it was a jobless recovery. The same thing happened around the time of 9-11. Right? Early years of George W. Bush, there was an economic recovery. Wall Street recovered, but there were no new jobs and the income of average Americans was dropping. And essentially what happened was that the capitalists had developed a mechanism for essentially um, insulating themselves from the results of their actions. They developed all kinds of means, whereas the standard of living for average Americans could keep going down and they could continue enriching themselves like private prisons. Fine, the standard of living for Americans is going down. Things are getting worse for average Americans. So maybe we'll make profits from locking people in prison. Another, another thing they did to insulate themselves, big pharma, right? So Americans' living standards are going down. Let's get them addicted to opioids, make them dependent on painkillers. That'll, that'll you know, ensure our flow of profits even as their ability to purchase goes down, right? Let's create a huge market for psych meds and antidepressants, right? As Americans' lives become unstable, as people's self-esteem decreases, oh, let's, let's turn that into a way to make money. Let's wage more wars. Let's sell weapons to autocratic regimes like the Saudis in the Middle East, like the regimes in, in Kuwait, like the, uh, the, the government of Jordan, like the United Arab Emirates, like the brutal autocracy in Bahrain that oppresses the Shia majority of the population. Let's arm, arm you know, brutal juntas and regimes. Let's build up Taiwan's military to try and threaten the People's Republic of China. Let's send weapons all over the world so that we can keep making profits as the living standard of the American people continues to go down. The capitalists have figured out so many mechanisms for trying to insulate themselves from the natural result of their decisions. But as we saw in 2008, it doesn't work. It only works for so long, but pretty soon things come crashing down. Pretty soon, the capitalists have to face the results of their decision. Their greed brings the chickens home to roost and we see a financial meltdown that shocks the world. The lead up to the financial crisis of 2008, they say, why, why were all these smart people so wrong? Alan Greenspan, all the, the economists of Harvard, how could they not stop this? Let me ask you, could great geologists, great scientists get together and stop a volcano? Right? If you found, had a volcano that was about to go off, could you assemble great scientists together who understood how volcanoes work, who understood how the lava works and the rock and the plate tectonics, and they understood it, and if you assembled them together, would they be able to stop a volcano from erupting? Of course not. Of course they wouldn't be able to stop it because volcanoes erupt. It's what they do. 
and capitalism leads to economic meltdowns. That's what it does. And now in the United States, I read you that part in the article where they're worried about political backlash. They know it's going to give rise to populism. It's going to give rise to people demanding that the state take action to protect their lives, to protect their incomes, to protect their jobs. And that leads me to another point, which is very important to understand. And if you want to understand socialist organizing, you want to understand what's happened in Latin America and what's happened in the socialist movement around the world, you need to understand this. And you need to understand the reaction to it by the global media and capitalism. It seems that right-wing dictators are back in style. Right-wing dictators are back in style. This is a photo from El Salvador, where the right-wing autocrat, Bukele, uh, has so many people held. Horrendous. Horrendous situation, uh, what's going on in the prisons there. This is, this is an autocratic regime that's repressing workers. And there's mild condemnation of it from liberal sources. But why is it there? During the Cold War, the United States government had a policy of backing right-wing strongmen, like Trujillo, right, in the Dominican Republic. Right-wing, torturing, murdering dictator. Marcos in the Philippines. Um, go down the line. Suharto. Park Chung-hee and Sigmund Rhee in South Korea. The majority of South Korea's existence hasn't been democracy. It's been military dictatorships. Why is it, Somoza in Nicaragua, very good, Dengas gang, why is it that these dictators were being backed? Well, they were being backed to stabilize society, to stabilize countries and lock them down to prevent communist revolution. Right? Guatemala, right? They had a democratic government in Guatemala, and the result was a socialistic president, Chicago Arbenz, who was in a, an alliance with the Communist Party getting elected. And so the USA toppled Arbenz and installed a military dictator in Guatemala to make sure that no socialistic government came into power. You had Batista in Cuba. Why, why was the United States doing this? It was to lock down these countries, to lock them down. And actually, what you saw, especially during the Kennedy administration and Lyndon Johnson, we're talking the 1960s, is there was an effort to help these right-wing dictators raise living standards, right? There was so much economic growth going on in the socialist countries that it became necessary for the U.S. government to start loaning money to these dictators and letting them build up a kind of middle class that would support them. In South Korea, we saw that the United States forced Japan to loan millions of dollars to Park Chung-hee and to create POSCO, to create the steel industry. And that created a layer of middle-class people, of well-paid middle-class workers in South Korea that would be loyal to the military dictatorship so that the socialists and communists could be crushed. And it was brutal. They had prison camps. They rounded up orphaned children and worked them to death. There were horrendous things done. But in order to do it, you had to create a middle class. And in Latin America, it was the same way. In Chile, in Argentina, uh, in many different countries, you saw the United States loaning money, the United States basically enabling these countries to develop some layer of their own manufacturing, their own mining, their own industries, to try and stabilize the dictatorships, to create a middle class strata in these countries that would be anti-communist. So at the same time, in the urban centers, they're executing communists, they're, they're breaking the trade unions, they're sending people to prison camps. They're also raising the living standards, right? They're creating a layer. And that's generally how Bonapartist regimes or dictatorships tend to work, right? If you're going to have an autocratic military state that's capitalist, you're going to need to maintain a layer that is loyal to it. In Nazi Germany, for example, right? Hitler did a lot to maintain a layer of German workers that were loyal to his regime. Um, and that if you're going to have an autocratic regime like that. And so what happened? Well, the communists had to flee from the cities and go into the countryside. Che Guevara, right? Guevaranism, Fidel Castro, the Cuban revolution wasn't made. It didn't start out in the cities started out in the countryside. The cities, there was so much support for the regime, there was so much political repression, it wasn't going to work. But they went to the countryside to wage the revolution. 
And many revolutions followed this pattern. Nicaragua, the revolution started in the countryside. Communists went into the countryside and waged guerrilla warfare to fight against the imperialists. And that was how they had to organize. It worked to some degree. Nicaragua had a socialist revolution in 1979. El Salvador uh, had socialist uprisings. Um, you know, there, were, there was moderate success for that strategy. But things started to change. The first major change was in Chile. Right? In Chile, you had free elections. You had a socialist government that got elected. You had, you know... You had Salvador Allende, the socialist president, who was elected. Then in 1973, you had a coup, and Pinochet took power. Pinochet was a military dictator, but he was different. He was different from the other military strongmen throughout Latin America at the time. Because Pinochet was not a Bonapartist. Pinochet did not implement policies to try and stabilize Chile. Pinochet opened Chile up to being economically looted. He sold it off to the highest bidder. He killed communists, he killed trade union organizers. It was a brutal military coup, but he didn't do what Park Chung-hee did. He didn't do what Batista did. He didn't do what the various strong men, the Shah of Iran did. He didn't build up a middle class. He actively worked with Milton Friedman and the Chicago boys to demolish the middle class of Chile. That's what he did. Very different policy, right? Chile had 20 to 30% unemployment. The jobs of the miners were, were I, mean, I mean, their wages decreased. The, the food subsidies were just gotten rid of. There was mass starvation. Children became mentally disabled for the rest of their lives because of extreme childhood malnutrition in the aftermath of the coup. I mean, horrendous results, horrendous results. The economic fallout uh, of, of Milton Friedman's demented experiment in Chile People suffered in mass. It was, it was disastrous, but it was a military dictatorship that was allowing neoliberal economics. It was looting. And we saw the following later in Argentina. The same thing happened. The, do, uh, the relative of Perón, Isabel Perón, toppled a U.S.-backed military dictatorship that privatized everything. Bolivia, right? Similar situation. And especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, you saw... You, you saw a new wave of economic reforms in Latin America where these anti-communist governments backed by the United States were not creating a middle class. They were allowing international banks to just loot their countries, to make them poorer, to sell off their assets, to, to sell off, to destroy their domestic industries. But at the same time, there started to be a shift, right? Because there was not economic Bonapartism going on, you saw a political opening up, right? The, the ruling classes of South America, of Latin America, would prefer, would prefer to have a more rule-by-consensus government. They would prefer to not have one military leader make all the decisions. They would prefer that there be things more open. Furthermore, the U.S. government would prefer it that way, too, because they don't want some kind of big, strong military leader who could tell them no, and that happened. Right? These military dictators that the USA was backing would occasionally make demands and, and force the United States, twist the arm of the United States to give them more loans, give them more money. They didn't like that. Instead of wanting strong men, right-wing strong men who could deliver the goods, kill the communists, and, and stabilize society, the United States started wanting economic neoliberalism to loot the country, number one, and they wanted to have free elections so that the governments became weak. They wanted weak governments that they could just push over to get everything that they wanted. That's what they wanted. They wanted governments that were so small, pathetic, and weak, they could drown them in the bathtub. They wanted weak, pathetic governments that would be able to be forced to implement neoliberal economics. And it was a shift. It was a shift in how the politics worked. No more, starting in the late 80s, 90s, no more did the United States seem to want, you know, right-wing military dictatorships. Instead, they wanted open societies. Open societies that would allow unlimited free trade economics, but open in the sense that there were multiple party elections, uh, that there was some freedom of the press, some freedom of religion. We started to see that. That was a shift, right? And, and a lot of these military regimes fell. In Chile, we saw Pinochet forced out of office, 
um, you know, and, and we saw governments coming into power across Latin America that were open, where they would have free elections, and they would sign on with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and the country would be economically looted, right? In Venezuela, right? I, I talked to Venezuelans about this when I was there. I heard their stories about how every year, in order to get their IMF loan, they would have to cut government spending. The government would say, you, you're, you're being spent, you know, the IMF, the World Bank would say, you're spending too much money. You are spending too much money on sanitation workers. So in parts of the country, in order to get their loan money, in parts of the country, you know, the, the garbage would stop being collected. In parts of the country, uh, the electricity would stop going on because the IMF and the World Bank would say things like, oh, you're spending too much money. You are spending too much money on maintaining those public power plants. In Bolivia, the water, the rainwater was sold off was sold off to American corporations. They privatized the water. The water was privatized. All the natural resources, the oil, the mining was privatized. In Venezuela, there were big cuts in public transportation. And it was an explosion, a popular rebellion against the rise in costs of public transportation that was called the Curacazo. The, the Curacazo. It was an explosion. And it was that that gave birth to the rise of Bolivarianism in Latin America. But here's the thing. Here's what happened. Because the situation had changed. Before, communists couldn't organize in the cities. Before, communists couldn't participate in elections. So they ran to the countryside and they waged guerrilla warfare among the peasantry. But things changed. Things drastically changed in the 1990s. And communists in Latin America meeting in Cuba, having big international meetings, understood, communists in Latin America understood that their tactics had to drastically change. The conditions had changed, and so their tactics had to change. And there was a complete reorientation. And the communists of Latin America switched their tactics. Instead of trying to wage guerrilla warfare in the countryside, because it was impossible to take power peacefully, because, uh, because you know, it was impossible to organize in the cities, they flipped and they went back into the cities and they built coalitions with priests and with labor unions. And they were able to build strong alliances against neoliberalism. Let's remember, in 1999, when Hugo Chavez first took office in Venezuela, he was not in favor of socialism. He said he was for neither capitalism or socialism. He was for what is best. What is best for Venezuela. But we saw in 2003, he announced that Venezuela was building 21st century socialism. Bolivia, movement towards socialism, Evo Morales elected, understanding that his election was a referendum on neoliberalism. The Sandinistas were voted back into power in 2006 after they had been voted out of office. They were voted back into power, making clear that they were the candidates who would stand against neoliberalism. And the communists, because the communists could shift their tactics, instead of waging guerrilla warfare in the countryside, they organized in the cities. Instead of going it alone and using violence, they used peaceful means and organized popular fronts, coalitions, political parties that were polarizing the country against neoliberalism and economic cuts, working with priests, working with trade unions, working with associations, getting communist groups, Trotskyists, Maoists, you know, Marxist-Leninist parties, social democrats, all to work together in a popular front. Because they were able to drastically change their tactics, to really drastically change things, we saw socialism suddenly on the rise. They had announced after the fall of the Soviet Union that socialism was dead. Socialism, oh, it's dead. It'll never rise. But pretty soon it was rising in Venezuela. It was rising in Bolivia. It was rising in Ecuador. It was rising in, uh, in Nicaragua. It was rising uh, in Brazil. You saw the growth of socialist parties. You saw a social democratic administration with a strong communist faction backing it. All over Latin America, you saw a rise a rise in socialism and Marxism once again. And why? Why? It was because the communists had been willing to change their tactics. They saw what was working, what was not working. They understood that conditions changed. So they 
changed their tactics. They turned around. They turned around. And you know, the Chinese Revolution, going way back, we're going back to the 1920s and 30s, the Chinese Revolution happened for the same reason. Mao was a brilliant organizer. His family were middle peasants. They were somewhat wealthier, but they were from the countryside. But the Chinese Communist Party had operated only in the cities. The Chinese Communist Party, the Trotskyite faction wanted them to form independent trade unions and such. The majority faction that was supported by the Communist International wanted to go into the KMT and into the, into the nationalist movement and recruit, which was the correct thing to do. But they worked within the cities. Right? They, they operated within the cities when the overwhelming majority of the population of China was in the countryside. But in 1927, there's a huge uprising in Hunan province. And so Mao, someone who grew up in the countryside, is sent to go to Hunan, is sent to go to Hunan to try and figure out what's happening. And he goes to the Hunan province. And in the Hunan province, he sees that the peasants are rising like a storm. He writes, all of those who've been downtrodden in the dirt, who've never had a voice in society, are rising up like a mighty storm and smashing the trammels that bind them. Those are his words. And he writes this beautiful essay, Report on the Peasant Uprising in Hunan, published in 1927, and it's a burning polemic against his own party because he sees that his own party is ignoring a huge social development. He writes that when the masses are in motion and the people are rising, you have three choices. To stand behind them, gesticulating and criticizing, to denounce them, or to stand at their head and lead them. And every Chinese will be free to choose, but they must make the choice now. Read that 1927 essay, Report on the Peasant Uprising in Hunan. It burns with passion because Mao is seeing this huge social explosion happen all across China. And his own party, the Communist Party, is ignoring it because they have contempt for the peasantry, because the, the uprising is particularly bloody. And that's where Mao's famous quote, he writes, A revolution is not a dinner party. It's not painting a picture or doing an embroidery. It's an act of violence, whereas one class violently overthrows another. This is Mao's most famous essay. And what is he doing? He's doing exactly what the communists of Latin America were urged to do. He's urging his own party to turn around, to go in a different direction, to change tactics because conditions changed. And pretty soon, the Chinese Communist Party, as we know, was forced to change its tactics. The KMT, the Nationalist Party, started killing communists. The communists were forced to flee to the countryside, and pretty soon, Mao had formed the People's Liberation Army among the peasantry. And it was a peasant revolution. Socialism was brought to China largely by the peasant population. A lot of students, a lot of urban trade unionists, but it was the peasantry that made the Chinese revolution. And if the Chinese Communist Party hadn't been able to turn things around, socialism would never have come to China. This is an important understanding for anyone who is serious about Marxism and socialism. If you are able to turn things around, to change how you see things, to reorient yourself to new conditions, there is hope. But if you get stuck in a rut, if you get stuck in a routine, if you start trying to act out what people did in the past, if you're LARPing, if you're sticking to a permanent tactical orientation, if you're making the same mistake over and over and over again, if you do that, you can't call yourself a revolutionary. The success of revolutions throughout history have always, 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 always been based on the ability of communists to rapidly turn things around, to change their tactics dramatically in order to move toward taking power. The Bolshevik Revolution, a great example. 
Lenin came along and he said, a loose association is not going to do it. We need a party of new type. A party of a new type that will practice democratic centralism. That's the kind of organization we need to actually take power in Russia. And it worked. Lenin, in 1903, he turned things around. He reoriented the Russian revolutionary movement. And in 1905, there was a huge uprising. And then in 1917, the working class was able to take power. Turning things around, dramatically shifting. That, that is what proceed, precedes a revolution. It always has. But folks, this understanding that one can change, one can move in a different direction, one can turn things around rapidly, it's actually very big. It's a very big part of American culture. A very big part of American culture. You know, before the American Revolution, there was a mass movement in the United States that they called the Great Awakening. Now, it was a religious movement because at that point, that's how people generally understood politics. But it was a, a mass movement where all across this, the 13 colonies, I should say, you had ministers and clergymen going to people and reviving their faith, stirring them up with big speeches, pointing to parts of the Bible that talked about tyranny and injustice. And it was the awakening of the consciousness of the people of the 13 colonies that later laid the basis of the American Revolution. And before the Civil War, which was what Marxists referred to as the Second American Revolution, before the Second American Revolution, you had the Second Great Awakening in the United States. You had ministers and, and pastors going around and, and stirring up their flocks and talking about the evils of slavery and tent revival meetings being held and, and, and you know, different new religious groups being formed like the, like the Seventh-day Adventists or the Mormons. A lot of American congregations can trace themselves back to the Second Great Awakening. There was an awakening in consciousness that expressed itself in terms of religion, again, because that's how American politics was at that time where American people all throughout you know, the United States, throughout the, the Midwest, Illinois, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Maine, New England, you had this revival of religious sentiment, urging opposition to slavery, urging that women have the right to vote. Many people don't realize that, but those tent revival pastors that preceded the first, the first the Civil War were very, very in favor of women, um, women having the right to vote. And there was an awakening in consciousness that laid the basis for the second American Revolution, the Civil War to abolish slavery. And interestingly, and this I, I find to be fascinating, is that the hymn, the song, that was kind of the theme song of the Second Great Awakening, um, and I'm not going to sing for you. I don't, I don't sing uh, on these lives. If I do, I do it kind of tongue-in-cheek. Uh, but the, the theme song was the hymn that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Or you, if you haven't been, that's okay. It was called Amazing Grace. It's still widely popular among religious groups and such in the United States. A hymn called Amazing Grace. And this, the, the hymn Amazing Grace, interestingly, itself was about this understanding that you can turn things around. Right? The story of how the song Amazing Grace was written. It was written by a slave trader. Right? This was a man who owned a boat. And he would go to Africa and take African people back to the United States to become slaves. And he had friends who were part of the Second Great Awakening. They were Christians. They were part of this mass anti-slavery religious revival movement that was going on across the United States. He didn't agree with them. thought they were wrong. And the story is that the man who wrote the song Amazing Grace, he was on a boat. And that boat was on its way to Africa to take African people, put them in chains, bring them back to the United States in slavery. And that boat was hit by a storm. And he feared for his life. And as his boat was hit by the storm, it was in that moment 
that he decided to turn the slave ship around. He decided he was not going to participate in slavery. Right? It was about turning things around. And that became kind of symbolic for the United States because there was a feeling among people like John Brown, the abolitionist, among progressives, the early Marxist movement, that things, the United States was going in the wrong direction. It had seized Mexico to have more slave territory, more, more slave states like Texas. The United States, because of the plantation owners and the you know, slave owners of the South, the, the rising power of bankers on Wall Street, the United States was moving in the wrong direction. And the rallying cry of the Second Great Awakening, this mass revival of religious movements in the United States, the rallying cry is it is we need to turn the ship around. We need to start going in the other direction. And yes, John Brown and Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, they framed it in religious terms. But it was an understanding that we're going in one way. And if we keep going in this way, it's only going to get worse. We need to turn things around. We need to start moving in a new direction. We need innovation. We need to start doing things in a new way. And I would say, in the United States, we need to start doing things in a new way. We absolutely need to start doing things in a new way. Capitalism and the rule of profits, the rule of big bankers on Wall Street is leading us toward disaster. The global system of monopoly capitalism, imperialism, capitalism in its highest stage, is leading us toward disaster. Wages are dropping. Profits are being made from prisons, from opioids, from wars. It's unacceptable. We need to turn things around. We need to start moving in a new direction. And on the left, the organized political left, we also need to start moving in a new direction. We absolutely Start need, need to start moving in a new direction. Anti-populism, the idea that average Americans are our enemies, that needs to be gotten rid of, right? The belief that drugs and drug use is somehow good. We, we should encourage people to get high and, and that's, that needs to be gotten rid of, right? The rejection, the rejection of science and dialectical materialism, that needs to be gotten rid of. We need to go back to the scientific roots of socialism, the idea that we're going to lead the masses of people to fight for their needs, to fight for justice. We're going to build solidarity. We need to see the masses of people as the heroes. We need to build solidarity, anti-racist solidarity, to show that racism is bad for all workers, to show that, that racism is the enemy of all working people, that we want to we want to raise everyone up, starting with those who've been oppressed and faced discrimination their whole life, but really going to everyone. We want all living conditions. We want all of the American people's lives to improve. We want to change our relationship to the world. We need to change things on the left. We need to turn things around. We absolutely, desperately need to turn things around. Folks, you know, you never want to be too sure of anything in your life, right? I mean. I mean, let's be real, right? You, you never want to you never want to just blindly believe something. You want you want to be able to question things, right? You want to be open to possibly being wrong. Right? That's just part of the way human beings are. But folks, the reality of the fact that socialism is superior to capitalism. I mean, it's so obvious that socialism is superior to capitalism. Folks, I'm pointing, I've got The Economist here in front of me. Again, not a Marxist publication. But they're talking about two places that have been very, very, very effective in defeating the coronavirus. And they've actually done it very cost-effectively. Not only have they been effective in preventing infection of the coronavirus, but they've done it without spending huge amounts of money. And what places are they? They are Vietnam, a.k.a. the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, and Kerala, the province of India, run by the Communist Party of India Marxist. These two provinces have done so well in defeating the coronavirus. This is The Economist, quote, Vietnam and Kerala both benefit from a long legacy of investment in public health, 
particularly in primary care, with strong centralized management, an institutional reach from city wards to remote villages, and an abundance of skilled personnel. No, not coincidentally, communism has a strong influence as the unchallenged ideology of Vietnam and as the brand touted by the leftist parties that have dominated Kerala since the 1950s. The two places that have the most cheaply and effectively worked against the coronavirus are places where Marxist-Leninists, tankies, not anarchids, not liberals, Marxist-Leninist tankies are in power. And this is from the mouth of some of the biggest enemies of socialism. You can't make this up, folks. I mean, look at Russian history. I mean, I, you know, Russia became a superpower with socialism. It was with socialism that the country was industrialized, fully electrified, wiped out illiteracy. Furthermore, when Russia became capitalist in the 1990s, according to what you learned in school in the 90s, should have been the best time in Russia's history. When they privatized everything, they finally had freedom. The Yeltsin administration, Russia, Russia under free markets, under neoliberalism, under the IMF and the World Bank was a nightmare. They tried free market capitalism in the 90s, and it was a nightmare. And do you know how they solved it? Do you know how things got better? Do you know how Russia's economy was repaired? It was repaired because, starting in 1999, Putin nationalized oil and gas, right? He, he put the oil and gas under state control, and he re-centralized the economy around the state. So things got better in Russia when they moved away from free market capitalism. You can't make this up, folks. You can't make this up. All across Eastern Europe, right, there were many countries that were implementing free market reforms, and then the Communist Party was overthrown, right? In Romania, Czechoslovakia, Albania, East Germany, all these countries, all across Eastern Europe, Poland, all of them, capitalism was, was restored. And the result, mass poverty and suffering. And in China in the 1980s, they had market reforms. They significantly changed their socialist system. But they kept five-year plans. They kept the Communist Party in control. And now China is the second largest economy in the entire world. Right? 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty. China has the world's hydro, largest hydroelectrical power plant. It has the world's fastest supercomputers. It has at this point, at this point, the world's biggest telecommunications manufacturers. Every day, another Chinese person becomes a millionaire because they reformed. Sure, they adopted market reforms, but they didn't overthrow socialism. They didn't return to capitalism. They broke they turned things around. They didn't stick with the old so Cold War model. They adjusted things from the Mao era. They turned things around, but they kept socialism. They remained true to socialism. They said poverty is not socialism, but to get rich is glorious. And now China is rising. Folks, it's very, 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 very obvious that socialism is superior to capitalism. If you want to be happy in life, you're going to need three things. Number one, you're going to need to be alive. Number two, you're going to need to have love in your life. And number three, you're going to need an ideal, something to believe in, a purpose. If you're not alive, if you don't have love in your life, you don't have an ideal, you're not going to be happy. But if you have those three things, you can be modestly happy. However, You'll notice that all three of those things that are necessary for human beings to be happy are things that you can't experience on your own. You can't be born without other people, right? I'm not going to give you a sex ed lecture. I think you all know what I'm talking about, right? Number two, you can't love all by yourself. You have to have an object to love. You have to love someone else. Someone else has to love you. In order to have love in your life, there has to be another person involved. Furthermore, a purpose or an ideal is also something also something that requires other people. It requires working with other people to achieve something. The basis of human happiness is collective. It's cooperation. It's working with other human beings. Human beings have always been collective. When we were hunter-gatherers in the woods for the majority of human history, 
the times when we had the slave empires and built the pyramids and, and Rome and Greece, up into feudalism in Europe with those beautiful cathedrals that were built, up into modern-day capitalism. There is nothing in this world that anyone can say, I made that all by myself, right? Even the most, you know, you know, solitary wood carver is going to use tools that were made in a factory by hundreds of other workers. I'm looking at you right now. I'm talking to you right now over this broadcast. I'm looking into an iPhone that was manufactured by hundreds of other people, processed and shipped by hundreds of other people, sold to me by other workers, that human beings, everything we have as human beings is creative, created collectively. We human beings are brilliant and amazing because of our ability to work together. We're not amazing and brilliant by ourselves. We're miserable by ourselves. Probably the worst thing about this pandemic is the fact that we're alone. In fact, we're isolated. But when we human beings work together, we can make miracles happen. We can unleash creativity. We can do amazing, amazing things. But it requires collectivism. It requires group identity. It requires shared ideals. It requires love and human cooperation. Marx, Freud, Darwin, those are the three thinkers that really kind of defined modernity, right? The modern era. Sigmund Freud brought us, basically laid the basis of modern psychology. Charles Darwin laid the basis of modern biology, an understanding of human beings and the descent of man. And Karl Marx laid the basis for modern economics, right? They were all flawed in their own way, but they were all revolutionary. They all broke the rules. They all challenged the existing status quo. However, however, they were all wrong on one point. They were all of the viewpoint that human beings are animals, that human beings exist simply to avoid pain and to seek pleasure. They thought human beings were just like dogs and cats and sheep and mice. And if they could understand uh, human beings' biological urges, they could understand human beings. They did not comprehend that humanity had a spiritual side. They underestimated the selflessness of people, the ability of people to work for ideals, the ability of people to make sacrifices for higher principles and higher truths. And we understand why they did that, because they were coming out of feudalism, right? The brave new world of capitalism had torn down feudalism and in feudalism in feudalism people were taught to think of you know think purely in spiritual and religious terms religion was kind of the totalitarian method that feudal autocrats used to rule so bringing in science and rationalism and thinking of human beings in biological terms was a breakthrough it was revolutionary they did a great job of 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 changing the way we see human beings but they went a little bit too far with it. They went a little bit too far with it. Freud would have us believe that so much of our behavior is motivated simply by unconscious sexual urges. Darwin, uh, Darwin talks about survival of the fittest. Uh, he didn't actually use the phrase from what I understand, but you know, that's attributed to him. Marx writes a letter to Frederick Engels and says, why do I exist, right? This will all just naturally happen, economic determinism. So why, are you, why am I writing these books? Why am I doing this? They were, all, they were all a little bit too hard in their materialism. And it hurt their movement to some degree or other because spirituality and passion and selflessness and courage, this is the basis of human civilization. Human beings are not animals. They do have a higher side. And if you don't appeal to that, and if you think of human beings in the way a zookeeper might think of the people, the, the animals locked in cages, you're not going to be able to effectively organize them, right? We know that, right? That there was a, a coldness and a cold materialism that caused damage to the socialist movement. But we are now in the 21st century, and we see that being turned around. And we see Xi Jinping in China and the Chinese dream and how they are combining Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought with Confucianism and the brilliance of Chinese civilization. We see Bolivarian socialism in Latin America where they're 
largely influenced by religion and the teachings of Jesus Christ and, and mass religious movements, religious communes like I visited in Caracas. So things are changing. Things are changing, right? And socialism is adjusting for our time. And it should always be in a state of adjustment. We should always be willing to turn around and change things. And I just want to end my opening remarks here before I start doing the roll call and taking all your questions by telling a brief personal story. Now, some of you may have heard this story already, but some of you have not. So I'll just tell this story. When I was 15 years old, my parents allowed me to spend a Saturday afternoon at a communist bookstore. And so I went from my little town in Ohio all the way up to Cleveland, and I went to Cleveland Heights, Coventry area, and I went to a Marxist bookstore. And of course, that was like amazing for me to be able to be at a Marxist bookstore where they had the writings of Marx and Lenin and Mao and stuff like that on the wall and books about Marxism was like amazing to me. But I will never forget something that happened when I was 15 years old. It was a life-changing moment when some other communists they patted 15-year-old me on the back, and they said, we're going to go sell the paper. They handed me a stack of communist newspapers, and they said, we are going to go sell the newspaper. And I must tell you, I looked at them. I was scared shitless. I said, wait a second. You want me to go out and go to people I don't know, people who might not agree with communism, people that are, people I've never met before, walk up to them randomly and try to sell them a newspaper about communism. Are you out of your mind? And they said, nope, we do this all the time. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't do this. Um, they said, nope, you got to do it. And I said, well, can I just give it to them if they don't? No, 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 got to get a dollar. So I went out on the corner in Coventry, Coventry, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. I walked up to people. Uh, you, you, you want a, uh, an article on uh, socialism? You know, we got like a socialist paper. It's a newspaper that's really, really against George Bush. Do you want to get a copy? Uh, but I was very, very nervous, extremely nervous. I, I was not comfortable doing that. And part of the reason I was uncomfortable is because my family had been particularly angry with me for being a communist and had urged me to stop expressing my views. At school, I would raise my hand in social studies classes and argue about communism. And my family had urged me to stop doing that. They said, you're bringing a bad reputation to our family. You're embarrassing our family. Don't argue with communism. Don't be seen with Marxist books. You're embarrassing us. And I was being taught to be ashamed of my communist politics. And so being told that I should go out and talk to these people was the opposite of the message I was getting in my parents' household from my brother, from other people. No, no, no. I was an embarrassment. Only idiots would believe in communism. Everyone knows capitalism is the only way. And if you go out and express the, the view that you're a communist, you look like a fool. I was constantly being given this negative feedback. But they told me to go out and sell that newspaper. And you know what? I sold one newspaper. And I sold another newspaper. I remember that day, I sold a newspaper to a guy. And I was wearing my letterman's jacket because I, I had played sports in high school. I played soccer and whatever. So I was wearing my letterman's jacket. And a guy saw the O on my jacket, you know, for Orville, which is my hometown in Ohio. And he said, well, you know what, young, young man, I'll buy your newspaper because you go to Oberlin College, right? I see that O. I didn't go to Oberlin. I said, okay, and sold him the newspaper anyway. And... It was a beautiful experience. I learned that day when I was 15 through the process of overcoming that fear and overcoming that nervousness that I was damn good at selling newspapers. In fact, I read so much about communism. I'd argued with people so much about communism. I was pretty good at it. When people said, you know, communism's evil, I had an answer. And it was such a beautiful, empowering experience. I didn't have to be ashamed of who I was. This was something I knew about. This was something I understood. This is something I could be proud of. I never stopped. I haven't stopped. And that's the thing. I keep going, folks. 
people all thought when I was finding my way out of a certain political organization that I was done. They said, okay, Caleb's just going to go back to living a normal life. Caleb's, no, 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 no. I'm not done. Because folks, communism, socialism is what gives me life energy. It's what keeps me going in this world. This world's so full of pain and suffering. If you're on a ship in the ocean and you don't want to get seasick, you have to keep your eye on the horizon. Right? The ship is moving around, it's shaking, but there's one thing that is steady, that's constant, that's unmoving. And that, that is the horizon. And socialism and Marxism is my horizon. It is my reason to keep going. And it can be your horizon too. It's the only hope we have in this time. The only way we can get out of this crisis. And now is the time to ask yourself. I'm not going to ask it of you. Just ask yourself this question. What have I done for the revolution? What have I done for socialism? What have I done for Marxism? How can I make a greater effort to get us out of this nightmare? What can I do? Can I get more involved in the effort to build the Center for Political Innovation? Can I give a donation? Can I distribute socialist and Marxist books in my area? What can I do to make a better contribution to the revolution? What can I do to get us out of this nightmare? What can I do to point to the way out of this disaster? What can I do? I challenge you this coming week, it's Monday night, but this coming week to ask yourself, what can I do? What can I do to build socialism? Because I can tell you the truth, folks. I told you there are only three, there are three things you need in your life to be happy. Life itself, love, and an ideal. And socialism is a true ideal. And if you want to be happy, if you want to feel fulfilled, you need to find an ideal to live for. You need to have truth to believe in. Socialism can be your horizon. There is a way out of the nightmare of capitalism.